Okay, uh, Laura, take us away. Hello, I'm Laura Cam, Communications Director for the Jewish People Policy Institute. JPPI is an independent center of thought and planning for shaping strategy and policy for the Jewish people in Israel and the diaspora. As such, during this time of real crisis, and was likely to be the beginning of a complicated and protracted war, JPPI will share on a daily basis deep analysis and insider views from on the ground in Israel. Yaakov Katz, JPPI senior fellow, former editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post and author of numerous books on military strategy will open and moderate today's discussion, followed by Shmuel Rosner, JPPI senior fellow, researcher and political analyst. Anat Wilf, a former JPPI fellow and member of Knesset. And finally, Gil Troy, another senior JPPI senior fellow and historian and prominent Zionist thinker. They, along with the rotating roster of experts, will throughout the next days communicate with you live. Please ask your questions in the chat box and we will get to as many as possible. Yaakov, over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thanks uh, for everyone for joining us uh, to Inat, Gil, and Shmuel, and of course the JPPI. Uh, I also want to thank our partners for this series that we're going to be doing throughout the conflict. We don't know how long this conflict is going to go on for. We don't know the nature or scope yet. We know what we know, and we're going to talk about that. But uh, we want to thank our partners, which is the Jewish Agency for Israel, as well as the Jewish Federations of North America, which have partnered with us to make this possible. And you can watch this uh, on our Zoom link, as well as uh, on the Times of Israel website and on our different social media channels. So we really look forward to hearing from you, getting some of your questions, your feedback, and uh, trying to give some clarity in a period that is full of uncertainty. There's no doubt that we're now just about 36 hours after this conflict began yesterday, Shabbat morning, the day of Simchat Torah holiday here in, in Israel. We're still in that fog of war period. And there's lots of questions that everyone, definitely in Israel, but around the world, people who care about Israel, but even those who are skeptical, are wondering what happened, right? There's a lot of questions. When you look on the military tactical level, there's three blatant failures that we can point to. The first is, how did we have no intelligence? How did we not know a single thing about what was going to happen? A thousand Hamas terrorists crossed into Israel, and Israel does not know our vaunted intelligence agencies. How did that happen? Question number two is, once we failed with the intelligence, how did our defensive measures on the border not stop them? We've spent billions of shekels on the border fence, cameras, remote control guns, drones, you name it. How did that not work? And then question three is, why did it take the IDF so long to get down there, to deploy to those communities in what's known as the Gaza Belt, or Teif Aza, in that area, and to start to go door to door and clear out those hundreds of Hamas terrorists who had committed literally massacres. But time will come for that later. There will have to be investigations, and we could talk about that. The priority now, as we see it within Israel, is first, the IDF is focused on clearing out the South getting rid of all those infiltrators, preparing the reservists who have been called up, tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands by now, and get ready to launch what is likely to be a large scale ground offensive into Gaza. What does that mean? We're going to get to. It. But after that, the next priority for Israel is to keep this conflict contained to Gaza. There is a lot of concern of what will happen in the North if Hezbollah gets a little trigger happy. And Nas Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of that terrorist organization, Iranian proxy, decides to do something. Israel, of course, does not want this conflict to spread and therefore is beefing up forces in the north and preparing for that and asking for help from its allies. And then three is to deal with the issue of the hostages, the people who have been abducted. We're told there's at least 100. Reports speak of many more. These are children, older men and women, middle-aged men and women, mothers, babies, all taken to Gaza. What will happen to them in the weeks and months to come and maybe even longer is going to break and rip the soul of this country apart, but that will come at a later point. So Shmuel, I thought we'd start with you. Give us a bit of insight, if you can, into at this period of time or this moment in history 
that what happened yesterday catches Israel. We've seen what Israel has been going through over the last eight, nine months. But it feels that even 36 hours into this, we are all still still in utter state of shock. We, we are in a, thank you, Yaakov, we are in a state of shock. And, and uh, I, I think this conversation uh, should in, in some way um, represent this fact to, to uh, people who watch us from, from afar. Israelis were shocked yesterday morning, and as the day um, uh, continued, and, and as we uh, woke up this morning, we discovered the horror uh, that that was Israel's um, surprise yesterday morning. Just, just to give you a, a, a sense of the numbers, more than 600 Israelis were likely killed yesterday. If you think about this in American terms, had this happened in America, uh, this would mean approximately 20,000 people killed in a surprise attack in the first day. That's a, a dramatic number of people. And if you add to the number of people killed, those who were injured, those who were kidnapped, uh, and all the others, the parents that are still looking for their children uh, who are abducted to Gaza, uh, these are horrific stories and Israelis are indeed in a state of shock. Now, as, as you said, this all comes on top of, uh, of a social crisis, social and political crisis uh, in which we are, uh, which means uh, two things. The, the, the political leadership is not trusted or not uh, well trusted by all Israelis. At least half of Israel's population uh, have very low regard for their leadership at this current time. And this leadership is supposed to take them into a prolonged conflict uh, with Gaza, with Hamas in Gaza, and possibly in other places as well. So you have the problem of leadership. And then you have the other institution, the IDF, the military, which was highly regarded up until yesterday morning. But then Israelis um, uh, discovered that the IDF is not well prepared for war, or at least yesterday morning, did not show anything that resembles the abilities that we were expecting from, from the IDF. So when you look at a situation in which uh, the public doesn't much trust the political leadership and have serious doubts about the performance of Israel's military and is looking uh, towards uh, this period of, of war, of conflict, of more rockets or or more um, or more uh, um, soldiers having to fight against terrorists, that's a that's a very disturbing situation. Uh, of course, we we all hope and we we all assume that Israel will overcome this situation. Israeli society proved in the past many times that it can come together in times of crisis and overcome these uh, uh, difficulties. But right now we are we are not yet there. We are in the second day. Uh, soldiers in southern Israel, not in Gaza, in southern Israel, are still fighting uh, lone gun gunners and all kinds of other militants who infiltrated Israel and didn't. We didn't yet uh, uh, have the uh, ability to find and and annihilate. And these people are still there. That's a huge problem. For civilians in the south, it's a problem for the IDF, both from tactical uh, uh, perspective and a moral perspective. And when you uh, take all these things together, uh, clearly this is one, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to say something dramatic, but I, I don't think any Israeli is going to disagree with me. This is one of the worst days in Israel's history. And, and that's the way we need to treat this moment and this situation and, the, you know, to, un to understand the gravity of the moment. So uh, thank you, Shmuel. Inat, you know, you, you have a great book on UNRWA and Western indulgence and the whole West's approach to the, uh, the two-state solution over time and the, the, the policies of appeasement or containment and, and, and things of that like. Uh, I, I'm curious, you know, when you think about where this all came from, right, it's easy to say 
Hamas terrorist organization bent on Israel's destruction. That's what this is all about. And there will be people on the other side who will say, well, what do you expect? These people have been locked up in a prison, the so-called occupation, et cetera. And it, you know, they've been fighting for freedom and this is their that this is their only way to get out. It seems to me to an extent that Hamas overplayed its hand. They might have been more successful than they might have thought, right? Uh in, in the in the beginning. And um, kind of like what happened to Nasrallah back in 2006. But but I am curious, when you look at the policy of containment, which Israel seems to have had with regards to Gaza since we pulled out of there almost 20 years ago in the summer of 2005, it blew up in our faces. What do you make of what's what happened here? You're muted, so... Now go ahead. Sorry. We have tried for many years, also in the way that a lot of people try to think about Palestinians, the conflict, the path forward, to differentiate between Hamas and the Palestinians, between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, trying to say, okay, uh, Hamas kind of hijacked the Gaza Strip. Uh, there is a deep desire uh, to believe that, broadly speaking, the Palestinians as a people have limited goals that a Westerner can understand, can empathize with. Uh, goals like uh, self-determination, ending the occupation, having a state, improving conditions in Gaza. These are limited goals that especially Westerners feel that they can understand. And what I have seen over the years, certainly since the publication of the War of Return five years ago, is that to the credit of Palestinians, they have been consistent and clear for a century. And this is the Palestinians. It's everyone. They have been clear about the fact that their battle is with Zionism. Their battle is not about the settlements. It's not about ending Israel's military occupation of the West Bank or the one that ended in Gaza in 2005. They're actually not looking to improve the conditions in Gaza. What they want is for the Jewish people not to have their state in any borders whatsoever. So to the credit of Palestinians for over a century, they've been clear and consistent, not just in their declarations, but in their actions, and of course, in their key strategic choices, rejecting any option for a Palestinian state next to Israel uh, because they want to have one instead of Israel. Now, Gaza in particular cannot be understood if one does not appreciate that the vast majority of Gaza's residents are people who continue to view themselves despite being born in Gaza, having lived in Gaza their entire lives, never been displaced by war. They view themselves as refugees from Palestine. Now they're in Gaza. Whatever your political view is, we can agree that Gaza is in Palestine, certainly from the Palestinian perspective. And yet Palestinians born in Gaza do not consider themselves people who live at home. They consider themselves refugees from Palestine, which means that Gaza to them is not a place that they want to develop. They're not looking to improve the conditions. They're not looking to make it into a prosperous example of how Palestinians can run a sovereign state. They want to use it as they have repeatedly and yesterday to devastating effect as a launching pad to take in their mind back what belongs to them, which is the entire territory of the state of Israel. This is what the battle is against. So, And ultimately, this is a century long battle of exhaustion. Uh, and we can win one battle, we can win one war, but it's going to take a while for the Palestinians, like the Egyptians, like the Jordanians, to finally, finally end their century-long battle against Zionism. But this is what it's all about.
Well, I, I can't say it's overly optimistic because it's it's not, but um, it means that this this battle is still is still long ahead. Uh, Gil, I do want to talk to you. You know, you've written your your historian, written many books, uh, but also have a special focus on U.S. Israel relations. So I want to pick your brain on that for a moment, and I want to talk about President Biden. He gave a uh, impressive, I would say, statement last night. Um, here, you know, for our evening in Israel. First of all, it's Saturday in Washington. The president doesn't always get up and give a give a give a statement. Uh, it was just the beginning of a conflict. Maybe he would wait a little longer, but he had uh, the sense of urgency to speak, for it to be live for the for the world to hear. And he had some messages in there as well. He also spoke with Netanyahu, and he said, "I will be in touch personally." With the Prime Minister of Israel over the next few days. Yaakov, just just to note that as we speak, uh, the Prime Minister's office released a statement saying that Biden and Netanyahu just had a second conversation. So, so exactly. So thank you. So proving exactly that point. This is after they didn't meet right for for nine months or so. They just had that meeting on the sidelines at the UN General Assembly just a few weeks ago. How do you make what's happening now? Biden, his administration, specifically the Democrats, the way he's standing very strong with Israel. What, what, what's kind of the inside story here? So for starters, we do have to say, God bless America. We have to acknowledge that this isn't just about Joe Biden and Bibi Netanyahu, whatever tensions they may have had uh, and whatever, whatever Biden said yesterday, that this is an ongoing, decades-long love affair. It's a strategic partnership. It's a values partnership. It's two democracies that have each other's back. And it's not surprising and quite rational that with all the tensions over the last couple of months, nevertheless, given those ugly images that course through our television screens and the blood that course through our streets uh, right here in Israel, that the president of the United States would stand up and say, we've got your back, we're behind you. But let's be honest, that's not enough. In the same way that in a few months from now, as you said, we're gonna have to go through a little bit of an accounting of what went wrong on this side of the pond, there's also gonna be a question about what went wrong on that side of the pond. To what extent was the Biden administration's, like their softness toward Iran. They certainly say critical things about Iran, but they don't have the same passion in denouncing Iran that many Biden administration officials have in denouncing Saudi Arabia. You feel a, a, a tonal gap. How did that play in? How did the $6 billion that the Biden administration allowed to go into Iranian pockets play in? How, do, how did Iranian strategy and Iranian tactics and Iranian weaponry help boost Hamas, both tactically and also existentially? So I'm definitely uh, very grateful for the United States of America and for its support. I think we have to see it grow and grow, but I think we also have to push back a little bit. Um, those of us who are not representatives of the government who should just be saying, thank you, and how can we work together? Those of us a little bit on, uh, you know, as as bridges should be thinking about these questions not only for the sake of Israel, but also for the sake of the United States of America and its global standing throughout the world. I want to say two other things, if I may. One thing is yes. that it's also really important that the American Jewish community understand that this is the initial shock, and unfortunately, there's a phenomenon, and we saw this also during the Gulf War. That I remember vivid pictures of a Star of David in a toilet, and that was very exciting on CBS News. When Jews are knocked down, when Jews are the victims, the world says, we're with you. But once we start defending ourselves, yeah. then we're going to have a very, very short stopwatch, and we're not going to have much of a timetable. And it's very important that American Jewry, our close friends, our brothers and sisters, stand up, learn the facts, read the books that so many of my esteemed colleagues um, here in JPPI and on this call have, have written and understand that it's important that we need time to solve this problem and we need time to, as you wrote so beautifully uh, in your column this morning, Yaakov, change the equation. And if I may, one more thing, because I think one of the things that's uh, interesting is we're all sitting in Israel. We all have skin in the game. Some of us, like I, have kids who are deployed and, and, and mobilized. I want you to know that I felt a change today. I woke up this morning in Jerusalem and there was a heaviness in the air. There was a hangover. There was a paralysis. And just in the last two hours, I've gotten more and more WhatsApps. We need 50 uh, backpacks for the South. My son's brigade needs 80 bars of soap and shampoos. And my wife literally just before this broadcast sent me a picture. She went with a shopping cart to fill it because I was preparing for this uh, Zoom. And she got 200 shekels from the Frischman family who saw these crazy shopping carts, knew what she was doing and said, we want to help. 
and yes, we've suffered a terrible blow. And the names of the, the dead are starting to come out and the stories and the heartbreak. And as you mentioned, Shmuel, it's also the, the trauma of those who even survived. What they're going to have to live with the rest of their lives. But we're starting to see, A, don't poke the bear. And the Israeli military is going to do what it needs to do. But also the Israeli people are resilient. And we are not, not going to give in. And we are not, not going to be depressed. And they are not going to knock us down. And we're going to do whatever we can. And that also our American Jewish friends can come, not write checks. Send love. And of course, a little bit of Venmo comes along to help us buy, uh, Vimo help, help, helps us come to buy more supplies. That's good too. Thank you, Gil. Uh, uh, moving remarks. You know, just one, one thing about the Biden speech yesterday, which I found very interesting, was that the, the, I think maybe the most important line was when he said, no one else should think they can take advantage of the situation. That was clearly directed at Hezbollah in the north. And we've seen a very tense day up there with some mortar fire, Israeli retaliatory fire, uh, soldiers now forces being bolstered along that border. Israel's, I want to say worst nightmare because there are, there are worse things that could happen, but a very big nightmare right now would be that Hezbollah does engage and their rocket fire would, would really be uh, potentially devastating for Israel. We could talk about that another time. So Shmuel, I do want to get back to you though. Uh, Bibi, right? Let's talk about him just for a moment. He's not someone who likes to use force. He's been prime minister for a long time, and we've seen he doesn't like to put boots on the ground. He doesn't like to send soldiers into Gaza. He likes the robotic, surgical standoff, you know, from a plane 30,000 feet up in the air or a drone. How much do you see when you look at his coalition? How much do you see is he being forced into an aggressive response, or is it just so? terrible what happened that he knows he 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 doesn't have another alternative he he actually is leading the pack right now no in in this case i think he was forced by by reality um, he's uh, what israel is reacting to um, what happened yesterday is is uh, you know we should call it by its name it was a massacre in many of the cases people were just slaughtered by armed militants uh, when they were partying in the woods or when they were walking in the streets or, or running or, or going to the synagogue. This was not an, a military fighting a military. Of course, there were also soldiers and, and police officers who died as they fought against the militants. And in many of the cases, this was a massacre of innocent Israelis, um, you know, like in a, in a, in a shooting range. Um, and I don't think any Israeli government could uh, look at such event and say we are going to respond with, uh, you know, measurably or with restraint. Uh, in such case, you must respond with force. You must clarify. The, the, when you think about, about uh, the way uh, countries project power, in this case, Israel needs to project power for two reasons. It needs to project power because it must clarify both to Hamas and Hezbollah and all other enemies that we have in the region that we did not lose our edge, that we can still be uh, fierce and we can still fight wars. So that's, um, that's the thing we must do for external reasons. But an Israeli government also must send an internal message to the Israeli people that we, uh, that Israel is still strong enough for Israel to withstand this attack and the next attack and the, and the, and the one after the next attack. We Israelis must be convinced that we have the power to defend ourselves. Right. And in this case, uh, you know, we, we did not have such power. We were, we were taken by surprise. We were slaughtered in, in the streets and, and in the woods. And the Israeli government is sending a message both externally and internally to the people of Israel that we're in charge, we still have the power, we will, um, we will recharge and we will respond. And if you, know, if you want historic uh, comparisons, you, you, you must compare it to the Yom Kippur War. When Israel yeah. was taken by surprise, and the first couple of days were devastating, but then Israel was able to overcome and turn, turn around the war. This is what 
the Israeli government and the IDF must do today. They must turn around the situation and make sure that we all understand, Israelis and non-Israelis, that Israel still have the robustness to defend itself and against all enemies. I just want to remind the people who are attending, you can put questions in the Q&A. We'll be happy to grab a couple of those. We're, we're trying to stick to a tight schedule to be done at 40 minutes after, so 22. Um, but just one, one, one comment on what you said, Shmuel. I think the difference is, obviously, it's 50 years just to Yom Kippur, but I think one of the differences is that Yom Kippur was soldiers against soldiers on the Egyptian front, soldiers against soldiers on the Syrian front. What we saw yesterday are people in being slaughtered in their homes at the at that rave, uh, people on the streets of Sterot and Ofakim and other cities, it, it, it almost under it questions the the whole raison d'etre of, of Israel, right? If we can't keep ourselves safe in our own homes, then 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 what is you know? And in, in these comparisons that people make to the Holocaust, of course, I reject those. I mean, we have just like you said, we have the ability to defend ourselves, but it, it, I understand where that does come from. Um, a not. You've been, you're a former Knesset member. You've been in coalitions before with the current prime minister, Netanyahu. Uh, I'm curious when you look at the offer that's still out there on the table, which hasn't been actualized yet, of a unity government between Prime Minister Netanyahu and Benny Ganser and or Yair Lapid, the two of them, one of them. How serious is this? Do you think it might happen? And if it does, would you anticipate any change in policy that we would see otherwise? Let's begin by saying that the current government is, I mean, it's a bunch of clowns and cowards. And one can admire Netanyahu for many years, but he has clearly collapsed now. He's uh, the only people who have courageously addressed the people of Israel have been President Biden, who still remains the only one who gave an inspiring, powerful, and clearly supportive speech, um, and, uh, and supports from all around the world, including, for example, from President Zelensky, our leaders, from Netanyahu all the way to the government, are literally missing an action. They have cowardly escaped talking to the people. They have completely collapsed. And... I don't think they understand what they're dealing with. I think they're still clinging to some world that doesn't exist anymore. And the sooner there's an understanding that this government has collapsed, and I will say even more, half of this government are people who have no moral mandate to lead people to war. It is people who as a matter of ideology, the ultra Orthodox, want their voters not to serve in the military, not to partake in Israel's defense, only take from the country. And, be, and now we're beginning to see that you cannot have people who are only taking and not giving. You have a bunch of messianic lunatics that as a result of their provocations in the West Bank, all of the military was there and again, either Israel has a military that defends its borders or it has a military that babysits pagan rituals in the West Bank. I mean, we can't have both. We have basically sacrificed Israeli citizens living on sovereign Israeli territory for the messianic delusions of people who are beyond Israel's borders. Okay, hey, not, this, so, we, 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 well, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I, get, I, I totally accept the criticism, all good. But just to the question of the chances of a unity government, we also have one of those questions in the Q&A, an anonymous attendee is asking, what are the odds of a unity government being formed? Okay, your criticism in place, accept it. Can, can Netanyahu kick those guys out and bring in a former chief of staff, Benny Gantz, a former defense minister, and Yair Lapid, a former prime minister? Let me put it this way. If he thinks that he can continue as is with the partners that he has and that he has a moral mandate, then he is uh, another rude awakening is coming. And I would say Benny Gantz and Yair Lapid have to in many ways take the reins of power from him if he continues to think that those partners 
are people with whom he can manage the state of Israel and conduct war. We are beyond political niceties and democratic coalitions. Either this is managed by people with a moral mandate and actual experience. With all due respect, other countries can afford to be governed by clowns and mediocrities and lunatics and they can survive it. The state of Israel cannot survive that kind of leadership. Okay. Uh, thank you, Einat. Gil, um, I want to ask you, you know, Einat kind of did touch upon the internal Hasbara, right? We're not hearing anybody, which I find to be deeply disturbing myself, which leads also to the state of shock. Nobody, the only person who I see speaking occasionally just now put out another statement is the IDF spokesperson. But where where is the where, where is the so-called Hasbara minister? Where where is the form? Why are people not talking before they even go on CNN? Talk to Israelis, reassure the Israeli people. But you know, if you could maybe also say something about that, but also what you've seen so far playing out in the international media. You wrote a great piece in, in, in the Wall Street Journal. You called it Israel's 9-11. In the piece that I wrote, I called it Israel's Pearl Harbor, but we had a similar point. Um, what, are you, what are you making so far, 36 hours in, of, of the Israeli PR? My understanding, first of all, is that President Herzog has said that he's going to address the nation uh, this evening. And uh, in, I think- In an exactly, hour, in exactly hmm? an hour. In exactly, exactly an, hour. an hour. And I think that's very powerful because I think throughout this whole difficult nine month period, he has been the one who has spoken to both sides with respect. He is the one who has really set a certain moral tone. And I think Anat, that yesterday we got a certain moral clarity. And we also were invited and frankly bullied into putting some of our political differences aside. I think we agree much more on our analysis of the government than we, than we disagree. But fundamentally, I think at this point, we have to play the hand that was dealt us. And we have a certain government in place. And I'm hoping that, that uh, Gantz and Lapid will come in. But for me, the most important thing is to make sure that we put our politics aside. We put our division aside. I think for nine months, we've been broadcasting weakness, division. And I think that was one of the factors. And I think when the inevitable commissions come in, we'll talk about that. I'm not blaming the left, and I'm not blaming the right. But I think right now we had a week, we had a day of moral clarity, and we're gonna have a week of moral clarity. And I think we really need to keep that uh, clear and we need to keep our goal clear. Our goal right now is to protect First of all, the South and protect every Israeli. Our right. goal right now is to mobilize the, the soldiers the best we can. Our goal right now is to hope that uh, Defense Minister Gallant, um, who was always seen as the grown up in the government, um, is is working with the the chief of staff of Tzahal and the leadership there, who also have again accounting to do eventually. And we've just got to focus on winning this war and 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 in some ways. This is not nice, but out crazying the crazies. Because if we don't disturb, if we don't return some uh, balance of deterrence and some balance of power and some balance of them fearing us more than we fearing them, we're in trouble. So, look, as I said earlier, the, the international community, uh, the Western world, uh, liberal Democrats are so far saying this is unacceptable. Um, President Zelensky from uh, Ukraine, uh, the European leaders, the EU, Americans are saying this is not going to stand. And it's terrifying, right? The notion that uh, that terrorism can, um, after 9-11, uh, come back, rear its ugly head, and do so much damage is very disturbing. But my question continues to be, how long? How long a leash will we get? And how long a timetable will we have to start doing what we need to do? So uh, I want to thank the three of you and thank Laura, Cam, also, Sahara, for for introducing all of us. Uh, just, I want to again reiterate, we're gonna be doing this every day for the coming week and possibly longer, depending on how long this conflict goes in, in, into the next couple of weeks. So uh, we're gonna be rotating and have different experts come from the Jewish People Policy Institute from JPPI who will be with us uh, here, 6 p.m. Israel time, uh, Sunday to Thursday, talking about what's going on in the conflict, what are the repercussions, what can Jews of the diaspora potentially do? Gil, you kind of touched upon that, but I think that's going to be a big issue for us as the days go by is what more can people do besides for opening up, you know, perhaps transferring through Venmo? Is there is there more that, that they can do? And Shmuel has done research, obviously, into polling and, and, and research and stats of, of sentiments and feelings of the uh, definitely the North American Jewish community about the government until now. And how will all that change? We have lots to talk about. Thank you so much for joining with us. Thank you again to our partners from Jewish Agency for Israel and JFNA. And that will be it for today.
let's all hope for a, a quiet and peaceful as much as is possible evening ahead of us. Thank you. I mean, thank you, Yaakov. Thank you.